So ready in three, two, one. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You start, you start, you start. Yeah. Three, two, one. Hi there, I'm Paul Wilkie. And I'm Janie Genosis. And we have the uptake today, a very special edition. Janie, what are we talking about today? Oh, today we found a really cool chart on marketingcharts.com, and we'll put that up for you. But it's about the top problems that U.S. CEOs want marketing to solve. And knowing that marketing and PR are kind of two peas in a pod, a little different, you know, check out our other uptake on the differences. And we talk a lot about that. But there are three within that top five that we felt were worth touching on from a marketing and PR perspective. So we're going to give you the PR take on those today. And and one of the things that, that I'm really passionate about is, and, and we've had a lot of experience working with a lot of different CMOs over the years. And I tend to put them into three buckets, and this may be fair or unfair. Um, there, there's the CMO who's very sales lead focus. They're the toughest CMO for PR people to deal with because they tend to either not grasp PR the way we do, uh, or you know they expect PR to be as quickly as successful as a marketing campaign. And that's usually uh, uh, that's something we usually have to dispel quite early, or it takes a lot of explaining, and, and that's fine. Uh, the other type of CMO is very brand focused, very traditional marketing, and the fact that you know they think about brand campaigns, ad campaigns, slogans, what's going to you know, logo presence, branding, all those things, and they're very they're very focused on on sort of getting the brand out. And we've worked with CMOs of those types before as well. Sometimes same challenges, but often they're they're very much in lopstick getting in terms of what PR can do and and what they can do in terms of building brand, which is great. Uh, they tend to focus less on the lead side and the business angle, which is where you know sometimes you know, we butt heads uh, on the PR side because it's not just about brand presence; it's about you know, a narrative and, and a vision. So we try to we try to work together with that. And then the third type of CMO is the one that gets both or is focused on both the business side, the sales leads, and the brand and the brand presence and the brand volume. Uh, they tend to have a more holistic view of marketing as a, a concept. And they also tend to get PR and understand PR's role a lot better. So those are the three types of CMOs we see. Um, and if you're a CMO watching this, which bucket do you fall into? Or do you agree or disagree? Let us know. We'd love to hear it. But um, I think sort of setting that table is kind of a great way to sort of go back to um, uh, to the chart that, that uh, Janie referenced. Absolutely true. And I can see why some of these CMOs are really focused on driving revenue getting new customers and bringing in those sales because those are the top two that the CEOs want out of them. So of course that's going to have to be their focus, but it's really nice when they are holistic and they understand that really the next three on the list are more of a long game. They're more PR focused as well. And that's to stay ahead, differentiate, grow faster than the competitors. And differentiation is a, is a real key in public relations. Uh, the next one is improving on brand and reputation, which PR is, is all about. And then really transforming the company's narrative in the marketplace. So those are the next three that on the chart. And so let's, let's start with uh, differentiation since that seems to be the most important important one in PR. Paul, what would you like to share about that? Yeah, I think the big thing with differentiation, especially with PR, is, is and, and we see this in the messaging process. How do we talk about the company or how do we talk about a product in a way that differentiates from the competition? It's very easy, um, you know, with smaller companies that we've worked with, it's very easy to sort of compare yourself with a competitor. One of the things we try to do is we try to, to focus more on differentiation rather than uh, a comparison, because that's those are the messages that that tend to resonate both with your potential customers, but also with the reporters. They, they like to know what's different, what's unique, what's special about you or the product you offer. So um, 
that's kind of where where we sort of build in the mystique into the messaging into the story uh, to to help with with being lockstep with with what the CEO wants to achieve and also what the CMO wants to achieve. And and everyone is unique. Every company is unique. So um, one of the things your PR folks can do is work with you on what is that differentiation message that you want to get out there. You know, I mean, it may be if you tweak it just a little bit, it'll be more effective or it'll be more newsworthy. So that's where a PR pro can really come in and help you do that better, I think. I think to sort of wrap that up is, you know, one of the things that we do in interviews is when we you know, very often a reporter will ask an exec, you know, how you know, how do you compare, how do you differ from, you know, the competition or a, a specific competitor? And very often we counsel, don't talk about the competition, talk about why you're unique and, and the problem you're solving rather than how great you are. And that's a great uptake to watch on pivoting that we talk about when you get those questions and you don't want to exactly answer them. There are ways to do that. So watch yeah. our other uptake. Um, let's move on to brand and reputation. And um, one of the things I think that frustrates me sometimes about not necessarily marketing people because they know, but a lot of times it's sometimes those CEOs and things like that is they don't understand that brand is more than a look and a feel. You know, brand is more than a logo, more than a slogan, more than colors that you choose. And it really does link to reputation. So if you yeah. say Nike, for instance, I mean, everybody has, everybody knows the swoosh, right? The, the, the words, but what does Nike represent? You know, that there's the just do it campaign. You think of the ad campaigns and you think of, did you buy a pair and did they hold up? You know, there's, there's that side of it too. And that's something that, you know, with, with PR, we always hope that our clients are, are providing excellent products and services out there because no amount of PR can fix crappy products and services it just can't so um i think that that that's something to think about you know it's it's that holistic approach and then how do you get that information out there and paint that picture use that language we have a we have an uptake on tone of voice and authenticity yeah. it's, it's a great one to watch too so so paul what are your thoughts on brand and reputation and you know um i was fortunate to work at visa for almost 10 years in house and during that time, we had two different CMOs and both had an entirely different approach to brand. But it was a fascinating look at brand because Visa is a brand that is ubiquitous. It's literally carried in people. The logo is in people's wallets. More people you know, carry Visa cards than any other card in the world. And you think that that ubiquity carries weight across messaging. It doesn't. One of the one of the things that we did with reporters um, for years, uh, we would start every interview, and we would tell our execs start every interview, you know, explaining what Visa is and what Visa does. You know, your your average consumer thinks, okay, yeah, they issued by credit card, um, <laughs> and and Visa does more business with debit than credit, and they don't issue cards. They're the network, the banks issued cards, you know. You know, conduct transactions on. So you you have you know with this huge brand, you have a basic misunderstanding of what the company does, and if a reporter doesn't understand it, that's not going to get commuted. That messaging is not going to get carried through. So you know, um, brand gets you so far. The logo gets you so far. Great positioning gets you so far. It's it's expanding and explaining beyond that that really makes a difference and you know with like i said with a company like visa if if people don't understand what your company is if you're a smaller company they're definitely not going to know so don't don't be afraid to take time to talk to a reporter or in your ad copy or in anything you're doing explain who you are what you do Always, always. And yeah, that's that's interesting. Visa is huge and people don't understand. And I'd like to talk about the not so huge because a lot yeah. of a lot of the companies that we work with, our clients are startups. They're in that funding stage. And um, one of the things that was was interesting, I think, on this, if you go on to the page, we'll, we'll share the link to this this chart. But they talk about another chart on um, analysts and and they were talking about publicly traded companies but you know i think it's true for companies that are in in the process of trying to raise funds brand and reputation 
were extremely important to these analysts. And, and so I think by understanding that PR is a long game, it involves consistency and authenticity and making sure you have your messages and all your, your ducks in a row every time you go out there, um, you know, that's going to help with fundraising too. So that, that brand and reputation are, are so, so important, not just to build customers and sales and an image with the people you're trying to sell your product to, but also if you're in the process of raising funds or wanting to go public, it's going to be huge down the road as well. Yeah, and and to add to that, you you have a you know one of the things that we we work with a lot of our clients on is when they have funding announcements, and there's a reason for that. You know, a funding announcement in and of itself doesn't move product. It doesn't you know do anything special. It's just you know you're a company. It's got you've got some money to play with, and you're on the growth project trajectory. But when we we announce a funding round or we talk about a funding round with reporters, we use that as sort of the, the foot in the door. This company is growing because boom, boom, boom. And you talk about why the company is growing. You talk about the problem you're solving. You talk about where the company's heading. You're not talking, you're not really talking, you're not really talking about the money and who's invested and how much. And um, that's not the story. That's the, sort of the foot in the door. Yeah, yeah, but but a good one, a great foot in the door. It's a great foot in the door. <laughs> We've seen some super six. We've even had, you know, working with some of these smaller companies and getting their foot out there and that are not even with the funding announcement, but maybe just an introduction of who they are and getting them out there, getting them on a podcast or, you know, quoted in yeah. an article, something even small. We've had we've had financial funders out there contact us and say, hey, we really like what you did with this company. Here's another company. Can you help them? And yeah. yeah. And and it, what's fascinating is it's, you know, early on, and, and a former colleague of mine, Will Valentine, has done some great research on the impact of funding announcements in terms of the news cycle. And I'll put a chart up here. Or I'll, I'll, I'll point to it. Uh, and and really, the the takeaway is it doesn't matter on the amount. It doesn't matter who's investing. It's really the story. It's really what the company has to tell and what's their, what, what's interesting. And the and the the funding is just the impetus to tell the story. Very important. And then let's let's jump to the the narrative. You know that, yeah. that final one there. And now we live in such an amazing, somewhat confusing and overwhelming world of communications. Well, oh, you know we we've got blog posts, we've got social media, we've got, um, you know, podcasts, and you can create your own video series on your website. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of endless where you can place your narrative. And, and that's good, because we're no longer at the mercy of the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, or even the most popular industry magazine that, that our clients are in, we can create our own communications, which does help a lot in creating that narrative. Yeah, it does. And it's not just the creation. You've got all these touch points with your audience, um, podcast, online news sources, your own blog, your own videos. And with each of those touch points, you have an opportunity to drive home a consistent key message, which is why, you know, very often we'll work with our clients early on. It's like, okay, how do we want to describe the company? How do we want to talk about what we do? What do we want to say? What are the, what are the wow stats? We, we, we put it, in, we literally put it in a one page document and, you know, we constantly refer to that document. What, what are we talking about today that we can inject some of these key messages in so that you know the market understands the opportunity, understands where we fit in that opportunity and and you know where where there's a call to action. And if we can do all that and we do that legwork early on, it makes every piece of communications easier to write, more impactful. And um, more accessible to the the core audiences. Absolutely, and we do media training with folks and get them to all sort of sing from the same songbook, which is really important too. So if you have your CEO talking and maybe your head of sales and and they're out there talking out into the public, 
you want them to be saying the same thing or saying it in a similar way, using some of the same phrases, some of the same words, some of the same wow stats, so that those get heard over and over again. Because while it might seem like you're repeating yourself, your audiences are, are really spread out and they're not going to remember yesterday and the day after maybe everything that they heard two months ago and it pays to remind them again. So um, I, I think that that narrative is so important to, to pin down and then also to, to use it, to, to train and have everybody in the company talking that way. Even, even your sales team and your, if you, if you're really in lockstep with marketing, you're going to use some of that in your email marketing and on um, in your sales pieces and things like that too. So everything is, is similar. We gun for consistency. Uh, it, it really makes a difference in terms of telling your story. You know, uh, you know, it doesn't always have to sound the same way because different outlets have different audiences and require something different. But there's always there's always a commonality. We always try to find that commonality. Politics, they do that very well. I think you know they you, do. You'll hear you'll hear some silly phrase and you'll hear it sixteen different times in a week. You know, it's like it yeah. I mean, politics should really be a a, a, an authentic phrase, you know, but it it gets it sticks in people's heads because people are are using it over and over yeah. again on the news. Well, you know, the stump speeches are a perfect example of that. You hear reporters complain if they're covering a, a politician on uh, you know, on a campaign, they will hear the same speech 20, 30, 40 times, and they you know they have it to heart. Um, you know, there, and there's a reason for that. It works. You know, you, they've refined the message. They've tested it. And that's not dissimilar to what we do in, in, you know, just general messaging as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think we've pretty much covered that fantastic chart. Thank you. Yeah. There's some you great know, marketing charts.org and Boathouse for, for doing that study. It's always good to kind of validate the things that we do every day and that, that long game that is PR um, and how we work together with marketing. So, yeah. So this chart is, fascinating we you know, we urge you we've, we've put it up and we'll we'll have links to it in the in the description but check it out and also uh we'll give you links to will valentine's funding research as well in the meantime if there's any question or any topic you want us to cover feel free to email mail us we'd love to hear from you uptake at brightcoms.com um on that janie any parting shots i would say just check out some of our other uptakes as well you know we've got the one on on um how marketing and PR are different. We've got one on your authentic voice and many more out there that, that might be beneficial. So if you're watching this all the way to the end, thanks so much. And we will see you on the next uptake. We appreciate it. Thank you.